Does the MVP have to have Kobe Bryant's footwork? Does the MVP have to be super fast? Why did Embiid really win MVP? He asked the media, what else do I have to do? Joel Embiid's stats are dipping again in the postseason, while Nikola Jokic looks better than ever. So are voters going to regret picking Embiid as their 2022-23 MVP? We'll tell you why. But first, let's break down their postseason stats. While both teams handled business in the first round of the NBA playoffs, one player looked a lot better than the other. And it wasn't the freshly crowned MVP. Jokic's Nuggets beat the Timberwolves in five, behind 26 points, 12.4 rebounds, and nine assists per game, while hitting 50% of his 4.4 three points per game. He followed that up with an incredible performance to start to the Suns round two series, averaging an insane 36 and a half points, 14 rebounds, and nine and a half assists per game through the first four. He's been able to do whatever his team needs to win, scoring, rebounding, and controlling the floor. Trying to back down Aiden. One of the all-time two-game performances for Jokic the last two. Embiid's Sixers swept the Brooklyn Nets in round one, but they were a team that snuck into the playoffs after trading away their two best players. That series was supposed to be a sweep. He spent two straight games injured, his Achilles heel throughout his career. After TNT announced he was our newest MVP, he failed to live up to expectations by putting up a measly 15 points in a 23-point loss. <laughs> During this postseason, Embiid's down 10 points per game compared to the regular season, only making 13% of his threes. Jokic, on the other hand, is besting his regular season marks these playoffs. This is the same story as the past five years for both players. So did the voters get it wrong? Before we get into that, let's break down the requirements to win the NBA's Michael Jordan Trophy for the most valuable player. Historically, MVP requirements have been pretty vague. Following this season, the NBA will be adding a 65 minimum games played requirement, hopefully keeping players from sitting out games in the name of load management. But we still don't have a clear idea of what most valuable means. Does it mean this year's best player, the undisputed alpha dog? If that were the case, Kobe Bryant would have a shelf of trophies, not just his one. Does it mean the league's most irreplaceable player, the one who best elevates his teammates? No, there's not a real way to gauge that. Is it the best player on the best team? It's not that either. That wouldn't lend itself to a very interesting MVP race. It's a mix of the three, and voters have to decide how to weigh each one. But wait a second, how about the way their game looks? Really? Does how their game look really matter? According to Keyshawn Johnson, Jokic is just too boring and too slow for him to win MVP. He's boring to me, and I've been saying it since day one. But He's Kevin. boring to me, I don't like it. It looks just, it, it, I don't care if he scores 100, I don't like it. Key, it doesn't look good to it me. It looks Dope. Yeah, it looks fresh. What are you <laughs> talking <laughs> about? Just slow Have you seen his passes? That's the thing. Passing is what looks good. I mean, it may not look the, great the, to you. The like passing he... takes forever to get to the other <laughs> side. He, he, <laughs> if you ever watch you want a laser pass? He's he's like it's ball so like it's a, slow. Like he's tipping a volleyball. Like I it's... understand, Jay. I get it. It just doesn't look. And you know, I've been saying this since day one. Everybody done ran up and down the court five times. He's just crossing the half court line. I mean, it's just slow. You, All right, so, look. Well, you, you're a Jokic hater. Does the MVP have to have Kobe Bryant's footwork? Does the MVP have to be super fast? If that's the case, De'Aaron Fox could have been a top candidate. Regardless of how the Joker's gameplay is, the way a player's game looks shouldn't matter. This year, Embiid's league leading 33.1 points per game and hard-nosed defense on the East's third best team was enough to earn him the 76ers first MVP since Allen Iverson in 2001. The last two years, Jokic's ability to carry a couple injury-riddled Denver teams gave him the nod, but we do know one thing that's absolutely certain. The MVP is a regular season award. We don't care about playoffs and we don't care about past performance. All that matters is that single regular season. Ultimately, it's up to the voters to neglect everything they've seen outside of that 82-game window. Neither one of these players has won a championship. Both at 6'10", both can shoot the three, run the floor, and both are very challenged at the defensive end. <laughs> Davis, take it on, Jokic. Jokic's closest call was a Western Conference Finals appearance in the 2020 bubble, losing out to the eventual champion Lakers. 
Embiid hasn't even made it that far. He almost made the Eastern Conference Finals in 2019, but Kawhi Leonard hit that insane buzzer beater in Game 7 to send him back to Philly. Now the Nuggets are back in the NBA's Final Four against the Lakers once again. But the 76ers are not. Another failed opportunity for Doc Rivers, Joel Embiid, and James Harden, as they lost a crucial Game 6 at home being up 3-2, to eventually getting dominated by Jason Tatum's Game 7 51-point performance in Boston. But those aren't supposed to matter in the MVP race. So if your argument for Jokic over Embiid is playoff success, think again. When voting for MVP, there's more than just playoff statistics to ignore. All season long, talking heads are spewing rhetoric, fair or unfair, about each candidate. While trying to hype up their pick, they usually end up tearing down the opposition as a result. Occasionally, it can get really nasty. That's exactly what happened with Kendrick Perkins a few weeks ago. And since 1990, there's only been three MVPs that wasn't top 10 in scoring that won that award. Dirk Nowinski, Steve Nash, and Jokic. Now what all, what do they have in common? He claimed that Jokic only won MVP the last two years because of his skin color. He falsely claimed that a huge majority of voters were white, a claim that his own ESPN quickly debunked. Embiid finished second each of the last two seasons, having to watch from home while Nikola Jokic hoisted the MVP trophy. According to Perkins, that's exactly how the white voters wanted it. It's pretty unlikely that voters took Big Perk to heart, allowing his feelings on the matter to sway their vote. If anything, it probably delegitimized his argument. He's made a career out of saying ridiculous things in a loud, boisterous manner, seeking to get views rather than to give legitimate insight. So if Perkins didn't sway the voters, what did? Before we get to that, let's break down the statistical resume for each candidate. Jokic almost became the third player in NBA history and the first non-point guard to average a triple-double for an entire season season. He put up 24 and a half points on an obscene 63% shooting, nailing 38% of his threes along with 11.8 rebounds and 9.8 assists per game. His points were down from the previous two seasons, but his team needed him to score less than they used to. Star guard Jamal Murray was out the last year and a half, and with his return to form this season, Jokic was able to play more of his preferred role, floor general. His 9.8 assists per game were by far a career high. His team won 53 games, most in the Western Conference. They were the best team in the league for the majority of their season, but chose to rest players down the stretch as they had a pretty firm grasp on the top seed in the West. Jokic played 69 games this season, a career low, but this was also the first time he wasn't fighting for playoff seeding. Embiid, on the other hand, was a dominant force offensively. He perfected every aspect of his offensive game, dominating the post, getting to the rim at will, hitting it from the outside, and making the second most free throws in the league, only behind Oklahoma City's SGA. His 33.1 points per game were the most by a center since Bob McAdoo in 1975. In the history of the sport, only Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and McAdoo had higher scoring seasons at the position. Embiid missed 16 games, dropping his team's record to third best in the East. They won 54 games, more than Jokic's Nuggets, but they were also forced to keep fighting down the stretch to retain their home court advantage while Jokic could rest. So both players had incredible stats, leading their teams to similar regular seasons season results. It's nearly impossible to compare the two outright. They're vastly different players. But what about their teammates? Who means more to their team? Embiid is playing beside James Harden former MVP turned exceptional second banana. Tyrese Maxey, a microwave scorer, Tobias Harris, who gives you a little bit of everything, and P.J. Tucker, the 37-year-old glue guy. Jokic plays with Murray, a borderline superstar, Michael Porter Jr., one of the league's most talented young players, Aaron Gordon, an underrated asset, and a lot of above-average role players. But the stats don't lie. When Jokic didn't suit up this season, his team went 5-8. The Sixers, on the other hand, went 11-5 in the regular season without Joel Embiid. So can you really say he was more valuable to his team? Why did Embiid really win MVP? There are two big reasons Embiid won MVP this season, and neither are great. First off, he's been campaigning for the award to no end. Last season, he asked the media, what else do I have to do when he lost out on his second straight trophy? His coaches, teammates, and even the GM, Daryl Morey, pleaded toward the media to give him the award he deserved. 
Anything less than being crowned the season's best player was treated as disrespect. You can't really blame him. That's an incredible honor that many historical greats haven't earned. Jerry West, Dwayne Wade, Elgin Baylor, John Havlicek, and many other top-tier icons never won the award. And when TNT announced his victory, the joy in Embiid and among his teammates was palpable. Jokic, on the other hand, repeatedly told media that he didn't care about the award. I'm not, I never play basketball to win, uh, to, to win individual awards. When he started sitting games at the same time Embiid was putting up massive numbers, he proved his point. The second reason he won is the same reason Michael Jordan, after whom the award is now named, only won the award five times despite a decade of dominance. Voter fatigue. It's really hard to win the MVP twice, let alone three times in a row. To win consecutively, you not only have to best your competition, but the previous version of you. Did 2023 Jokic beat out 2022 Jokic? Apparently not, according to the voters. Voters also take legacy into account, even though they're supposed to just focus on the regular season. But if Jokic won his third straight MVP, he would suddenly be mentioned in the same breath as Larry Bird, Wilt Chamberlain, and Bill Russell, the only other players to win three straight MVPs. Is it fair that voter fatigue and media campaigning can sway the MVP vote? Either way, Jokic being named the league's second best player is no insult, just like it wasn't an insult when Embiid finished second the last two years. Years. Both players had incredible historic seasons that aren't going to be forgotten anytime soon. But just like with Jordan, Bird, and every other all-time great, the legacies of Jokic and Embiid are going to be forged by postseason success. Do you think media campaigning and voter fatigue played a part in Embiid's first MVP? Let us know in the comments. For more NBA content, check out The Wrong Opinion, Useless NBA Trivia, and Garbage Rankings wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching Hooper's Lane.